Good evening, everyone. My name is Garth Reynolds. I'm the executive director for the Illinois Pharmacists Association, and welcome to our first in a series of programs on point of care testing. And this evening is going to be very much a overview and just a preview of uh, testing that can be done at a pharmacy level and primarily we'll be focusing on a community pharmacy level. Um, and as we go along tonight, feel free to ask questions either by um, putting your question into the chat or you can also use the question and answer function to um, put a question into the chat and I will address those as we go forward. Um, we, have a hard, we have a hard stop this evening at 8 p.m. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to talk tonight about um, what are CLIA laboratories and specifically our focus is primarily going to be on what are CLIA wave tests. And we'll discuss our focus on <clears throat> why wave testing is so important in a community pharmacy environment. And then we're going to spend a good time amount of time on completing how to complete a CMS 116, which is your application for a CLIA laboratory. Uh, this has been a primary focus of pharmacy um, since about April of 2020 during the pandemic, as we put additional focus on pharmacies being able to provide COVID-19 testing. Some of you on this call may have already have begun and started walking down that road of being able to provide point of care testing, but pharmacies have provided point of care testing for a number of years, but the numbers have significantly shot up over the last 24 months. And um, in and so this, this slide here from the National Alliance of State Pharmacy Associations or NASPA um, shows that we had about 12,215 pharmacies that were approved since May 8th of 2020. So we have definitely had a significant number of pharmacies. And if we look at Illinois, Illinois about 53% of community pharmacies are considered to be CLIA wave pharmacies. So we were actually already on a good footing here but I think there's still a lot of room for improvement. And I really think the focus and the question should be, are we actively using our ability to provide laboratory testing to our patients? And um, what's interesting is that we have 1,079 pharmacies that are CLIA waived um, in the state. And we're actually the third largest state when it comes to the number of pharmacies um, that are considered to be CLIA waived. So we, we should take some pride in that. We are a leader in this. And I hope after we go through this series that some of you who have decided not to um, offer point of care testing as of today will have changed your mind and help us as we continue to offer um, more services to our patients that are, that are desperately needed. So what are CLIA wave laboratories? And I think first we have to describe what CLIA is first. Um, CLIA actually stands for Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments, specifically of the 1988 Act. And um, they're regulations that help establish quality standards for lab testings that are performed on specimens collected from humans. And those specimens then are to help determine for the purpose of a diagnosis, prevention, or treatment of a disease, or the assessment of the health of that particular patient. Laboratory testing is regulated actually by three entities, so CMS, uh, the FDA, and the CDC. The CMS helps regulate the overall laboratory test, the laboratories themselves, any inspections, and the issuing of certificates, which is going to be a lot of our discussion tonight. The FDA actually helps categorize those laboratory tests based on their complexity and reviews West requests to be considered a WAVE test. So there, the FDA actually establishes what tests are considered to be WAVE. And the CDC then provides the medical and the scientific um, background of assistance and not only analysis and research, but also helps out with establishing a clinical laboratory improvement advisory committee as well. So the categorization of laboratory tests is very complex and there's, a, there's seven different categories that the FDA considers when it's looking at where to put a test and what to consider its complexity. And so they look at knowledge and the training and expertise experience needed to perform the test, what reagents are used and materials for the preparation, what characteristics of the operational tests that actually go into performing the test, how hard is this test to, to calibrate, 
quality control, the proficiency of the testing materials, and then looking at troubleshooting and equipment, and then how easy or how difficult is the interpretation and judgment. And this is all done on a scoring system, and that helps guide the FDA to its decision on where to place a test in its complexity. And the complexities fall into three categories. A high complexity, which is the highest category restriction for a laboratory test. Moderate complexity, which is where a majority of tests lie. And then wave tests. And that's what we'll be talking about mainly this evening. And what we mean by a wave test, these are tests that are waived under the regulation under the federal code, but they're cleared or approved for home use and are automatically char characterized as waived following clearance or approval and uh, by the FDA. And so uh, the testing a lot on wave tests really depends upon on that home use part of it. And if a patient can uh, perform this test on themselves, and that's a major factor in the um, consideration of a wave test. Now, that doesn't mean that every wave test is for home use. A lot of those still have to be done in a laboratory, which is what we'll be talking about with a CLIA wave laboratory, um, but it doesn't have as much complexity or as high laboratory equipment or a sterile environment as other tests may require in having um, additional laboratory standards. And other tests are then cleared in approval and categorized as moderate or high and it had and, and under another section of this uh, the federal code. There are actually over 1,400 CLIA wave tests, and that's not including COVID-19. COVID-19 and the EUA, because none of the uh, COVID-19 tests that are, are that are being used as waived um, or as CLIA wave tests have actually been approved. They're all still under emergency use use authorizations. Um, but when we take out COVID, there are actually 138 different types of CLIA wave tests, analyzing various different analytes. And um, I put the link here in the slides, which you'll be able to use on the uh, PDF handout that's in the chat. Um, you'll be able to look at that to see a full list. And it also then tells you which companies and their various identification numbers for those tests. And then most importantly, it also shows you which ones are considered to be over-the-counter wave tests that the patients can also purchase that you may want to offer to your patients. So examples of tests not only are glucose, and that's kind of where we, we our first thoughts tend to go to, like glucometers, and and um, and then also looking at measuring cholesterol, A1C, HIV, influenza, strep, and of course COVID, which has been our biggest focus over the last 24 months. This is an example of a of the uh, COVID-19 uh, EUA uh, database that's on the FDA website. So I really wanted to show you here because I know a lot of times, and it was um, it was very confusing in the very first months and weeks of pharmacies being able to provide COVID testing. There were a lot of companies reaching out and some companies were inappropriately reaching out to pharmacies past what they were, um, categorized for in their laboratory. So you see here like this very first one for um, Abbott, the ID now COVID-19 test is not only, uh, it's not only considered to be high or moderate complexity, but W, which is wave. That's the key part that you wanna look at when you're looking at the database for the COVID-19 tests. And if we go down here and look at this real-time fluorescent uh, PCR test, well, it's a PCR test, so that a lot of that's going to be considered in the higher complexity because of the laboratory equipment and the laboratory conditions that need to be maintained. And so um, it just shows you that um, the FDA was trying to make sure to keep up with this as much as possible. There were a lot of companies also advertising tests of pharmacies, and I know a lot of that has calmed down that were not, did not have approved EUAs. And, um, and, and so they didn't meet any of these qualifications. And of course, we couldn't utilize any of those tests anyway. So I did include, um, there's, a, there's a good document that I linked at the end of this um, presentation talking about how to obtain your CLIA certificate. And it has a really good um, FAQ or frequently asked questions section, but I didn't wanna point out some of 
what was in that part of that handout. And it really talks here again about what is a wave test. And it's really talking about how it's a simple laboratory examination or procedure that has an insignificant risk for error because we really, these tests have to be repeatable and usable in, in a lot of different ways, not only by wave laboratories such as a pharmacy, but also um, by the general public in, in many cases. Um, so there has to be a significant um, decrease of error or chance for error with these type of tests. And of course, we put in here a, a list of the wave tests in here again. Um, and then who can perform these? Um, can I perform tests other than wave tests if I have a certificate of waiver? Well, no, of course, you are limited to just wave tests. And that's, that's a big part is like really make sure that we stay in our roles and responsibilities as a laboratory um, because if you go out of that, it can really bring down a lot of risk. And of course, there can be inspection and fines um, put upon you for um, not properly being um, approved, assigned and inspected uh, for, um, uh, for a laboratory of moderate or high complexity. So traditionally and routinely, laboratories that are considered to be waived are not routinely inspected. Um, you may be surveyed um, if you ever had a complaint or um, they're performing a test that's not waived. So if something happens kind of like the board comes around and wants to talk to you, the inspector come around if they have a complaint. Same thing with um, the, the CLIA laboratories. And um, that mainly going to be done by CMS on a federal level. So again, you we, we traditionally try to work hard to make sure we don't um, draw the eye in any negative way of a federal inspector. And you definitely want to do that also with in a laboratory situation as well. Um, if I have more than one office or performing tests at one or more site, do I need additional certificates? Well, and that just really depends on the type of situations. And there's a couple different um, describers here about whether or not you need to have additional certificates or not. Um, you'll receive your certificate number, um, and we'll talk more about how that happens because this is a little bit of a confusing application process, and we'll talk about that here in just a couple of minutes. But um, what's really good about the certificate is once you have it, it's good for two years, and um, it's very easy to keep up to date. Um, just for instance, um, IPHA, we actually have a CLIA WAVE laboratory certificate. So IPHA is actually considered to be a WAVE laboratory, and we have been now for over 20 years. Um, and we've kept that because when we, back when we used to do laboratory testings um, and screenings at the Illinois State Fair a number of years ago, we had to obtain a license to be able to do those tests, to be able to perform those and offer those tests to the public. So um, we just kept and maintained that um, laboratory certificate because once we have it, there's no reason not to keep it up. So you do need to, um, on these tests as well, and we'll talk about this, that you'll have to notify your state agency. And when we talk about state agency, we're talking about the Illinois Department of Public Health. And you have to update them of any changes in ownership, address, the laboratory director, which for most cases for your pharmacies, that's gonna be your PIC. Um, and you need to do that within 30 days. Or if you wish to add more um, additional tests that are more complex, um, or if you're going, you know, if you're adding more and more stuff and you wanna make sure that your CLIA certificate is up to date with what you're providing. Um, do you need to follow all the manufacturer's instructions on how to perform the test? If one thing that you'll see over and over and over again is that we have to follow the directions to the bullet point, to the, the numerical and sequential sequence. We cannot um, shortcut and we can't use quick step guides or like what patients would use for their materials. We have to follow instructions um, to the letter as provided by the manufacturers because that information has been approved um, through uh, the FDA on how best to perform that test. And that includes also storage requirements and how to not only um, take the specimens, but also with how best to report um, any of those results as well. Um, and again, you know, can I use a quick reference guide stuff on the insert? No, we just covered that. 
Um, when performing wave tests, am I required to do anything in the instructions, even if some of the items are the manufacturer's recommendations or suggestions? Um, yes, you must follow all the directions when such terms as always required, shall, or must are used. So again, follow the directions. So let's actually dive into um, filling out the CMS 116, which is the application for certification for a CLIO laboratory. Um, this is actually pretty simple. And um, the way uh, I've got this laid out for you is um, I've got a couple of good couple examples here as we go through. Um, but at the end of the handout, I've also put in an, a, an additional example that is actually one page by page of the entire um the entire application so you can see that so really of this this application's uh number of pages i think it's like five pages of the actual um the actual uh, application itself but really when it comes to what we're wanting to do and what we're um, offering as a clear way laboratory and, and and asking for our pharmacy to be recognized as that it, you really don't have to fill out a lot of it. Um, because of that stature, we're not held to the scrutiny as if we were applying to be a moderate complexity or high complexity laboratory. So of course you would fill this out if this is your first time that your location has been, uh, is, is applying for a CLIO laboratory, you would hit initial application. The name of the director would be a pharmacist name. So whoever your pharmacist in charge is, or whichever pharmacist that you decide it needs to be a pharmacist, it has to be a healthcare provider. And then we go down to type of certificate requested, and then you would be putting in here certificate of waiver, since we're um, applying to be a WAVE laboratory. And then really the rest of this, you don't have to worry about because you're not filing for any type of certificate of uh, provider to perform microscopy procedures. You're not filing for a certificate of compliance. And you're not filing for a certificate of accreditation. Those don't apply to what we're doing here. So then it needs to know what type of laboratory are you? And of course, you're going to select pharmacy. And then it needs to know your days and times. So your hours that you'll be offering tests that more than likely mirror your hours of operation. And then are you applying to be a single site certificate to cover um, multiple testing locations? And you'll put no. If not, yes, then you'll need to um, put it in, in some additional um, uh, information. And th this example that I pulled from, this is from the Virginia Pharmacists Association on one presentation that they did um, on COVID tests in particular, was talking about the type of test. So you need to put an example of the test that you'll be providing. Um, and of course, they said, don't put the antibody test. You, you know, there's different tests that you want to make sure you don't, we don't misstate which tests we're actually offering um, and uh, because some of them are moderate high complex, uh, complexity. Um, but do add other CLIA tests. So you just think about all the tests that you may do. So you put like glucose, influenza, HIV, strep, COVID-19, you know, and all the different tests that you may offer, um, you want to make sure that you put that in there. And then they just want a, a, a estimate of the total annual tests. And it just, you just got to give the best estimate. It doesn't have to be right on. Um, so just try to do the best of what you think you can provide. Um, Dave Falk asked a really good question here. Can one pharmacist govern multiple pharmacies or does each testing site need an approved application? And so um, each site's really going to need an application specifically with how like Dave, how your pharmacies are designed. Um, and, but there's nothing stating that, that, it could not be the same pharmacist for each of those locations. There's not a limit to the number of laboratories that a pharmacist could be the director of. Um, so um, it's a it'd be similar to in how sometimes under Illinois law that we allow a PIC to be um, the PIC of a, more than one pharmacy. Um, in this case, a, a, PI, a pharmacist could also be a laboratory director of more than one pharmacy. But like our pharmacy licenses, you would need a, an application or certificate for each pharmacy. Um, we don't have to fill out the next page at all because that's all about non-wave tests and we don't, that's not um, uh, app applicable to us. And then um, you're gonna put that you're a for-profit entity. Um, and if not, then you need to describe your other type of um, status as a practice site. And then um, if 
like what we just addressed, if you're a director or affiliated with any other laboratories, you would put that here. So Dave, in the example we just talked about, um, once you had one store approved, you could put that for that license numbers for each of the following stores um, it, um, with the applications. And then of course you just sign in date. And it's really just that simple. Of a lot of the applications that we have to fill out, this definitely is not um, anywhere near one of the more difficult ones um, that we have to um, approach. So now that we've got it completed, now we need to submit it. So we, um, like I said, it's a little bit of an interesting process. So you actually, instead, you fill out the form, you get the form from CMS, but you don't send the form back to CMS. You actually send the form to the state agency, which in our case is Illinois Department of Public Health. But you don't send the payment to Illinois Department of Public Health. You actually hold on to the payment and then Illinois Department of Public Health, they'll process your application and then they forward that to CMS. Um, even in the heat of the pandemic, um, public health was actually turning around CLIO application, applications the same day of. Um, I would say there's still probably within a day or, two, day or two turnaround time. It's nowhere near the length of time and wait that we saw with eye care. Uh, on the immunization side, that has its own complexities, which we won't address here. Um, but once Illinois Department of Public Health has processed and approved your application, they forward it over to CMS. Then CMS will send you what is called a CLIA user fee coupon. Basically, it's an invoice for your registration fee. And you can pay that invoice by mail, or you can actually go online. And I've actually linked here the um, pay.gov link to actually pay for CLIA um, uh, fees. And the fee for this license is $180. And so it's 90 bucks per year. CMS will then mail that CLIA certificate to you. And again, that certificate's good for two years. And it looks very similar to the example um, certificate that we have over here on the left. So I've included here the address that you would mail your applications to that you, once you've completed them from CMS's website. Um, and when you go on to uh, CMS and actually the form that we have linked here in the handout, it's actually a fillable PDF. So you can just complete that PDF and then print it. And then you can either mail it, fax it, or even email it to um, Department of Public Health. And I would suggest emailing it, one, because you have an automatic tracking that you sent it, Plus, you know that they actually got it and the PDF is readable and it doesn't get damaged in the mail. So let's go through some additional information on uh, just CLIA wave tests in general. We already talked about, um, just as a reminder, anytime we have changes, it's very similar to Illinois law. We have changes in ownership or the name of our pharmacies or our location or your laboratory director. Um, you need to notify DPH, so that'd be Illinois Department of Public Health within 30 days. You don't need to tell CMS, you gotta do this, you gotta send it to the state agency. So each of the state agencies actually have more oversight over the actual administration um, within each jurisdiction, even though CMS handles the certificate processing and overall oversight of the registrations. Um, and then if you have any changes in your uh, testing, you need to um, notify them immediately. And that's what would be, if, I, if you had a significant change, like you never told them you were doing COVID and then all of a sudden you're doing 90% of your tests are in COVID, it would be a good idea that you notified them that you were starting to do those testings under your laboratory certificate. Additional resources, and those of you who have taken the APHA Advanced Training Program in Travel Health have heard me talk about um, some of these additional references before, uh, but just like the immunization program, the CDC puts out some really good guidance documents. And the one um, here is the Good Laboratory Practices for Wave Testing Sites. Now, this one is, it's rather outdated. It's from 2005, um, but the, the recommendations and the setup and the best practices that they, set, they, they um, discuss in here are still valid today in 2022. 
So um, I do recommend that you at least go through this and read through it and think about what you need to do operationally and policies and procedure wise for your pharmacy before you start um, you start uh, providing tests. Now, I would one of the things I would put on your checklist within the next week, if you are not a pharmacy that has a CLIA wave certificate, I would get that completed in the next week, just so you get that 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 um, processing going. Because yes, public health is going to be able to turn that around pretty quick, but you know you may still get a little bit of delay in getting those invoice numbers, and we're not in such a crunch time that they're allowing you just to run on your numbers as we did a little bit during the early days of the pandemic. So you do need to wait till you have your certificate, but get that processing, get those sent off and, and, and get that all going through the mail as you start to work through your policies and procedures, working through your wholesalers to figure out how best of you're going to either buy them from your primary or any other wholesaler to get you the best pricing for those, um, those lab tests. So I did put the link in here for the CMS 116 form. Also, you could look at that entire Obtain a CLIA Wave Certificate uh, handout, um, which has that extended FAQ. We went over most of it here on the slide um, deck tonight. But then um, if you want additional information from CMS, or Illinois Department of Public Health or the CDC. Um, I've included those links in here as well. Um, I also put in here um, the self-assessment checklist. This is also the CDC puts this in here that I would go through that checklist after I've read the good labor laboratory practices to decide um, if I'm ready or not. And this is one that we go through in travel health is um, helping you establish your approach to your practice to make sure that you are ready to go to provide tests. And then the to test or not to test. And again, this is a readiness booklet that the CDC puts out and it's very general um, and it's a little cartoony, but it helps with establishing those practices and those questions that you need to think through um, as an owner um, to decide, is this the best approach for my practice or how do I need to change it, what I'm doing now to be able to prepare for this as well. Uh, Rupesh, but as COVID tests are going down, what are the popular tests that are done in CLIA wave laboratories? Cholesterol, A1C, um, and um, influenza. Influenza and strep are still very popular even this time of year. Um, as we go forward here in legislation right now, we are working on an HIV prep and PEP bill that will um, be able to um, open up for pharmacists to be able to provide um, HIV pre and post prophylaxis to pharmacies. Um, that bill passed the House, it's in the Senate now. Um, and though there's HIV tests that have to be um, performed um, that the patient has to have done before you can start the assess the consultation. And some of that can be done through the rapid wave tests. So you could be able to offer those options in your pharmacies and some other testings that you may have for patients, um, not only uh, for patients with diabetes, you can, you can offer A1C testing in the stores to be able to help with um, those discussions that you're having with their diabetes and disease state management. Um, but there's a lot of different elements that we could go into. And I don't wanna dive too far much more into that uh, because that gets us more into what we'll be discussing more in um, later on in this series. But it's a really good question. There's a big realm in here. It's not just COVID. COVID is definitely our primary focus right now, but it is definitely not the only test that you can offer. Uh, under your laboratory. As we've talked about that this is a three-part series. So tonight was really a general introduction and really how to get that first step. And that first step is getting that CMS 116 filed and processed. That gets you going, gets you your certificate, so then you can go to the next steps. And the next steps would be looking at point of care testing training or an overview, which we're going to be doing in part two. But I do want to let you know right now, you could do part two a little bit early. Um, NASPA, uh, the National Alliance of State Pharmacy Associations, has taken over this program, which was originally developed by the Michigan Pharmacists Association and had been administered by NACDS for the last couple of years. So 
if you have taken a point of care testing before and it was from Michigan Pharmacists Association or NACDS, this is that same program. But NASPA has painstakingly went through this last year and has completely overhauled and updated that program. So if you have taken that before, I highly recommend that you really need to take it again because it talks a lot about what has changed since that program was originally um, written back in 2018 and 2012 revisions, um, and excuse me, 2008 and 2012 revisions. And um, it also has some new COVID um, related uh, modules in there as well. And so that point of care testing is actually being um, administered by NCPA and um, they're actually running it next Tuesday afternoon from noon to four. Um, the registration deadline is March 12th, and I did forget to put the link in here. So I will include that in the follow-up link with the handouts to you this evening. And, um, and it's really good if you need to get, if you still are um, having to fulfill some of that 30 hours that you need for this year's licensure cycle, um, there's 16, there's 20 hours in this program, 16 of it on home study and four hours live. And, um, and also there's a 15 minute virtual skills assessment. And so I took this program again last year, even though I took it originally when NACDS offered it and I was faculty trained at that time. I took it again just to refresh myself since I hadn't done any point of care testing myself in a number of years and just to, um, just to kind of go through the program again and see what, what was being added in. So this program is very easy to go through. It's all done online on the, on the home study. It's got some really good videos and the, the um, handouts are really good um, supplement material. So it's an easy 16 hours. It's not as difficult as some certificate programs. Um, NCPA is offering it. If you're an NCPA member, you can get it for $325. Um, if you're not an NCPA member, it's going to be $525. Um, and I just want to make sure you have this option now. Um, IPHA is actually a, um, an accredited uh, uh, site for this program, and we're going to be looking at offering it later this spring, hopefully in April or May. Um, but I do want you to be able to take this opportunity if you need to get that CE in before your you renew your license, that you can get that in. And again, that registration deadline is this Saturday. So please do consider that. I will send that link um, to that program to you. So like I said, next in the series is going to be that point of care testing. We're going to be really diving more into the individual tests. Um, and um, hopefully if we don't end up offering the training itself, we'll definitely do an extended CE programming of going into each of those different tests and test categories so you can get more familiar with the individual um, tests themselves. And then part three, which would be in May or June, um, is going to be on the monetizing. Um, yes, you can do this as a cash model, but there are ways that you can get a lot of this paid for um, through either medical billing, and we can talk about how that looks like, through incident to physician billing, or through um, uh, Medicare as well. So there's a lot of different ways that we can talk about that component of it, um, but this can be a revenue maker for you. Um, and so, and again, just trying to help you diversify and being able to offer more services as an advanced community and enhanced community pharmacy. And this will really help you if you are not already an ICPN pharmacy, an Illinois Community Pharmacy Enhanced Network, but are considering being part of that as we are an affiliate network of CPSN USA. Uh, we would really encourage you to really maximize your efforts of being an ICPN or CPSN uh, pharmacy, you need to be part, you need to be offering point of care testing. Um, and that really ends our primary program under the CLIA wave part one, uh, the point of care testing part one, um, particularly talking about the CLIA wave laboratory licenses. So that's your first homework assignment is to complete your application of the CMS 116. But I really want to take you through some additional reasons why we're offering this outreach tonight. And a lot of it is because we need you to be part of IPHA. Um, most of you on here are IPHA members, but I know some of you that are on here are not. And, um, and if you have been a member, you may not realize some of the new services that we're rolling out. And some of these are very new. 
Um, but last year we started the Community Pharmacy Membership and Advocacy Program. We recognize the impact of trying to work better together and making our voice of pharmacy even more prominent and louder. And we need to do that by trying to maximize some of you that have multiple stores. And so we're looking at that by giving you discounts to bring your entire team into the fold of IPHA. Because the stronger that your pharmacy and store are understanding what's going on, not only within practice, but in legislation, the, the better that you're offering, um, the better you're prepared, the better your patient care delivery is going to be, and the better you can rest easy at night knowing that you're compliant with everything. And so um, we offer different levels um, based on your location, and that gives you significant discounts, not only on the pharmacist membership, but also technician membership. And if you take up the next step, to put your foot forward in addition to your support financially of supporting our advocacy fund, we give you an additional discount as well. Because those stores that decide to help us with funding the fight, not only against the PBMs, but also the fight for advancing patient care and being able to do more items like we are right now with uh, um, with, with in the point of care testing realm, that's all because of our advocacy efforts. And that's because of your help and your support in, in enabling us to be able to do that. And, um, and I got a couple more things here and then I wanna turn it over to Rupesh who is our independent um, practitioner section chair and for a few words here at the end. IPHA has um, entered into an agreement with TRC Healthcare. You know them better as Pharmacist Letter. And we are now able to offer programs that were not available unless you are a major chain corporation or a major health system. And so we're able to offer some of their elite programming as Pharmacy Technician University and the Community Pharmacy Standard Bundle. And what's great about these two programs, the Community Pharmacy Standard Bundle allows you to be able to offer additional um, resources for your pharmacy team in addition to additional CE and training access. So if you need to have a one-stop shop for getting your HIPAA training, your methamphetamine trainings, your opioid awareness trainings, your you know, specific um, CE requirements, yes, IPHA offers a lot of that, but we're wanting to make sure that you have that in, a, in a, another fashion as well. Um, and so this is a very high quality product and we want to make sure to be able to offer that to you. And so we're offering this in a couple different ways. IPHA members, that um, if you're a community pharmacy um, independent section chair member, you can get this for $800 for your location. If you are a community pharmacy group member, so if you're part of this group membership and advocacy program, if you're stepping up and saying you're committing to helping support Illinois pharmacy, then we're going to give you an additional discount so that it's $6.29 per location. You're getting all the CE and training software access that would cost you well over $1,200 to $1,500 if you were doing this outside of IPHA. And you're gonna get it for $6.39. If you're a non-member store, you're gonna pay a premium for that. And then it's gonna be $960 per store. Still significant from the retail cost, but we recognize that, but you know, we do have to put that we, you know, we prioritize our members and that they deserve to get the best price. Next is Pharmacy Technician University. If you're not familiar with Pharmacy Technician University, TRC has worked hard to develop an online didactic program that can um, be utilized to help train and prepare your technicians, not only to be the best technician for you in a community setting, but also help prepare them for the certification exams. This curriculum that they've developed in this didactic online program is being considered to be part of what could qualify for accredited programs. So if you remember, there's gonna be some accredited um, standards coming forward. Well, if you get your technicians through PT, PTU, not only are we looking at trying to find ways through IPHA that will be discussed more at a later date of trying to help accomplish that, but you're gonna get them high quality um, training that prepares them and positions them for success in the curriculum program. And that's $750 per student for a member, for an IPHA member. If you're part of the group pharmacy membership, that's $600 per student. And if you're a non-member, that's 900. And I know some of you may be looking, well, that's an interest, that's still, that's, that's a lot of money. But if you're looking at the training dollars that you would, you would um, 
be spending and investing. This is what we have to look at. We're investing in our technicians to be the best assets for us. And if you were to send them to a community college program, one, they'd have to put, submit for financial aid. Um, and sometimes these programs aren't, you know, a couple thousand dollars. Some of the newer programs that are coming out there are, but they're not always obtainable in your geographic area. But some of these programs are very expensive and they're up to $15,000 or more for a technician. And they're not always the highest of quality. So this is a proven program. And you can invest in a technician and be able to know that they're going to be a better asset for you at the end of this program. So we'll be glad to provide additional information for you. And there's additional modules that are on here that kind of go an extension of these that, that um, some of that is in point of care testing. And so if you want to help train one of your technicians to help being assisting you in the management of this program, we can help with offering you um, some of the PTU Elite um, services as well. And then lastly, this is a program that we're going to be rolling out actually next week. And we're going to have another webinar on this actually next Tuesday night um, on um, an Illinois Pharmacist Association prescription savings card. We're working with um, Axe Prime who is a um, pharmacy benefit administrator. They actually have been working with discount cards and actually worked with the initial version of GoodRx before, as they said, they turned bad. And so this is a way for us to be able to offer a discount card service to you that doesn't charge you. It actually pays you. And so there's actually going to be a way that not only are you going to be able to get money back on offering an, on these transactions, to your patients, but actually some of that money will be going back to support IPHA as well. So it's a win-win for everyone. It's a triple win. You win, IPHA wins, and your patients win. And, and ever, everybody is um, getting better access to prescription pricing. And we'll, we'll have um, Al uh, Branca from X Prime who will be um, working with us. Um, X Prime is an NCPA corporate partner. And we have been glad to be one of the first states um, to be able to roll out an association level program of this scale. And uh, we'll be talking more about that next week. But we've been working hard for a number of years in trying to find a way to combat um, a lot of the uh, predatory uh, discount card programs out there like GoodRx. And then finally, here's my information and I'm gonna turn it over to Rupesh here in a second. But as you go through the handout, after this slide is another example where it goes through page by page, just so you can see yet another example. Um, so you have that for comparison. So Rupesh, give me a second here as I get this to where it allow you to speak. You should be able to speak now. You may have to unmute your line, Rupesh. Hi, good evening, everybody. First of all, thank you, Garth and Jamie for preparing and coordinating this program for all of all the independent pharmacists. I hope many of us got some value out of it. Uh, just want to sh share some things about what I've learned about IPHA. There are a group of gentlemen and ladies that have been working very hard behind the scenes. These guys have meetings almost every night. We get emails from Garth at two in the morning. We need, as independent pharmacists, I think it's our responsibility for all of us to be part of IPHA, join for a low value, what IPHA, when we had, when I had a chance to talk to Garth, I told him we need to see what value we get, what value we get as independent owners. So, oh, Rupesh, did we lose you? Rupesh, if you can hear us, we we lost your connection. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Nope. Go right ahead. All right. So, sorry about that. Um, That's okay. Yeah. So I say this guy, gentlemen, work very hard. And us as independent owners, we need to be part of our state association. Every one of us should be a member. Uh, I'll share something personal about me. IPHA is the reason I'm vaccinating. I am I'm doing the testing. They literally helped me. And I sent emails. There's a great team of Kim. Jamie, Garth, these guys are working continuously and they respond. 
IPHA is basically a corporate back end of independent pharmacies. Clinical is where we need to be. They have the resources. They are willing to share with us, but we have to put, play our part. Um, even state-wise, we have a gentleman by the name of Dave Falk. This guy is very active, has advised me in very many different things. There's Cody. These are great people, but it's now time for us to become members. All of us should be members, and I think this is a value. And and every month, there are town hall meetings. They're trying to educate us, our technicians. We all need to be part of the association. And if we are all part of it and we need programs, they are, they are willing to go and find the programs for us. So again, I want to thank Garth for preparing this first program, and I want to thank everybody that's on the call tonight for taking time out of your precious day to be with us. And hopefully you guys all got the value that, and we will share more information as time goes on. Thank you, Garth. Thanks, IPHA. Thank you, Rupesh, and thank you for your time as a member of the board of directors and as the independent pharmacy section head, you help provide the voice and advice and guidance of owners to the board of directors, which helps um, guide the association and all of the things that we're able to do. So thank you for very much for volunteering your time and effort and your leadership. Well, everyone, thank you again for um, joining us this evening. This again was part one. Um, my contact information is here. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we'll be glad to talk to you about all the different services, whether it's helping assistance with filling out the CLIA application, um, joining the association or, or changing your membership to that community pharmacy group membership, or if you're wanting to look more um, into the um, educational offerings through TRC, we'll be very glad to help you with those processes. Um, if you aren't already following us on social media, here we are, we're all over on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. And if you haven't um, um, listened yet, we do have our Farm Talk podcast as well. and um, with that, um, I don't see any other additional questions in the chat. Um, I will be sending out to you um, the handouts and that registration link if you want to sign up for the um, NCPA offering this next week of the NASPA point of care testing. Um, we did have one question here um, for Medicare Part B and Medicaid. What NDC uh, do we build for the rapid antigen test? And Ahmed, I'll take a look at that um, and I'll send that over to you. Um, because I'll have to pull that from my billing uh, slides. We'll talk more about that in part three, but I will pull that information for you and get that over to you. Any other questions? All right, everyone. Thank you very much and have a great evening. And we'll see you um, for part two. Have a great evening.